Welcome to all the, the um, submitters we have in the public and um, all the members. We apologies, we're a little bit um, shy through sickness, etc. And the mayor and deputy mayor uh, on their way. So we'll go through apologies first. Uh, we have those apologies <coughs> in front. Could someone please move? Yeah, happy to move. Councillor Walker and Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Any declarations? Confirmation of the minutes in the last meeting. Councillor Penrose, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Quacks, thank you. All those in favour? Aye. 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 There are no petitions. We have public input. Um, we have public input from four parties today, and I'll just remind everyone that's a strict five minutes, and then there are questions after that, so it is a strict five minutes. Thank you. So the first um, people we'll call up is, is Kevin, representing the North Coast Residents uh, Association, and I believe you want Grant to be with you as well? Great. Yeah, please. So thank you, uh, Grant, your, your opinion's been circulated to everyone. Um, and and your letter, Kevin, yeah. <coughs> May I start? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Kevin Clark. I'm the chair of the Sky Path Appeal Committee for the Northcote Residents Association. Firstly, councillors, thank you for the five minutes you've provided to explain the cost and funding concerns held by those of us who know about Sky Path's numerous problems. Auckland's Mayor has frequently stated that council cannot and will not support Sky Path unless the project is financially self-supporting. Sky Path Funder, on the other hand, has unequivocally stated that it will provide no funding for Sky Path without council's underwrite. In response to that, Council has provided underwrite and financial top-up in the sum of more than $1 million that we know of for its resource consent phase alone. You are being asked today to approve SkyPass underwrite. That assessment is naturally driven by revenue on the one hand, balanced against capital and operating costs on the other. Problem is, as our report explains in detail, you simply don't know what those costs are, not even approximately. So the question is, how could you possibly make this underwriting decision? Even simpler, how could anybody? That's to say, and let me explain, revenue will be driven by patronage, and that will be driven by NZTA's patronage restrictions. NZTA has yet to confirm those restrictions. NZTA's previous patronage restrictions eliminated any possibility of SkyPath being financially self-supporting. The other side of the cost and use equation for SkyPath, as with any business venture, is its capital and operating costs. A significant part of SkyPath's construction cost will be bridge strengthening costs. But again, nobody, including NZTA, yet knows what those costs are or whether such strengthening is even physically practicable. And unless the developers' operating costs have recently accommodated the cost of hundreds of wardens instead of just the two it planned on having, you won't know SkyPass operating costs either. Although Council claims that it needs a PPP to fund SkyPath, analysis of the published underwrite shows that Council is actually paying for the whole of the project anyway. And if you vote in favour of the proposed underwrite today, councillors, that is precisely what council will continue doing, fully and solely exposed, if SkyPath proceeds. It is our view, therefore, that any duly prudent governing body charged with deciding to underwrite or to further fund SkyPath would not have sufficient data to make that decision 
until such time as NZTA provides the facility's patronage limitations, and until such time as NZTA confirms the costs required to strengthen the bridge, and until such time as the operating costs are known, and finally, until such time as a properly audited business case is run on the basis of all these cost components, none of which is currently known. Ratepayers have recently seen Council's predisposition to enormous cost blowouts <coughs> on projects that were wholly capable of accurate pre-assessment. Not surprisingly, our Council rates increases this year was 30 per cent. That's some 60 times greater than the nation's residual inflation rate. We therefore now seek fiscal responsibility and appropriate probity from this Council. With reference to all the matters raised in our reports, therefore, we trust that you will agree that further funding in support of this private venture would represent fiscal and indeed legal irresponsibility <coughs> at this time and cannot rationally be proceeded with at this time, since every element regarding that decision remains unknown at this time, except that is the illegality of the proposed vote, which is known. In summary, we suggest that the purportedly private Skypath developer should now be required to start living up to its all-pervasive PR by meeting its own development costs and risks without further reliance upon Council's underwrite or cash prop-ups. Thank you. That concludes this uh, somewhat drastically abbreviated presentation. Thank you for the conciseness. Questions? Councillor Cash wants to say. Thank you, Mr Chair. Gentlemen, thank you. And thank you for the uh, work you gave us to preload the information, the written material. It's most useful. Um, in our reports, the patronage expectation figures are quoted as being conservative, and yet you're saying they are potentially overly inflated. Could you give further commentary on that? Yes, I can. Um, they, you're right. They can repeatedly described as conservative, but when you consider that, that those patronage assessments claim that, that Skypath will have the same patronage as the London Eye, claim that, that Skypath will have 60% more patronage than Skytower, claim that Skypath will have 100% more patronage than Milford Sounds. It doesn't take much to say, well, why on earth should that be so? Because all of their competitors, those competitors, uh, have ready access, have ample parking, have, uh, are not dependent on the weather, are suitable to any fitness level, and this is primarily, and that's to say 87.5% of its patronage, is tourism and leisure usage. So if, if this project, and it certainly is, prone to the weather and not suited to the fitness level of many of its um, targeted patrons, the first question you have to ask is, why is it going to be more successful than all those other things? And not just a little more, twice as successful, for instance, as the world-famous Milford Sounds. It hasn't a prayer. Thank you. The other thing about that, too, is that, is that its patronage isn't even going to be dictated by Council's many patronage assessments. It's going to be dictated by NZTA. And NZTA hasn't yet decided what that restriction will be. But there are good reasons for thinking that it won't be that much different from what their restrictions were last time. And their restrictions last time simply killed the financial viability of Skypath. And that is key to Council's risk profile. Thanks. George. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Kevin, can you just comment on, you're in the North Cape Residents Association, and it's been told that, oh, look, uh, a lot of people in North Cape Point even support Skypath. But what's your assessment of uh, the views of the local community on North Cape Point? Well, um, I, my report included um, a, a map in it which was, which was produced as evidence which illustrated um, of those who objected to Skypath and those who supported it. Um, it showed that overwhelmingly North Cape Point 
um, objected to, uh, to Skypath, and, and uh, that's a matter of evidence. It's not the evidence that Council told itself, however, where Council said, well, uh, had anyone beside or adjacent to the uh, facility objected to it? Uh, just another question is maybe to Dr Hewitson. Hewitson. Um, it's in relation to the, your um, finding that the council hasn't found, followed due process with this um, with this application and how we, how it's been dealt with by council in relation to the local government act and requirements of uh, <coughs> cons consultation. And so, can you just give us a synopsis of what your um, views are on that process, please? Yes, councillors. It's I was asked to look at a very narrow point, and that's the question really of what are your obligations under the local government act concerning this decision. I think it's important to start with um, the key principles that underline that Act. So back before this Act, councils were restrained in what they could do, but they were able to do that relatively in a straightforward way. Now this Act gave you a power of general competence, a power to do anything that you felt was right for your community. But in exchange for that broad power, you now have very critical obligations, particularly to consult with your community when you're about to undertake significant activities. That's the trade-off that's fundamental to this legislation. So the question I was asked is, have you complied with your obligations in terms of your accountability? And the most critical section of the Act is section 97, it says before you commence a significant activity, it must be in your long-term plan. And the reason for that is that your long-term plan is your key tool for consulting with your community and getting their feedback on what your infrastructure planning is going to be out to 10 years. That's your key mechanism for consulting. You get that feedback and then you as councillors make your decision about which way you want to go. But you must go through that step. And section 97 is clear and it says where you're going to commence a significant activity, you must have that in your long-term plan. So looking back to your long-term plan, the current one, while there's a brief mention of Skypath, it's very clear that it says this will be a future infrastructure project, but it's currently unfunded. So you were signaling to your community that you might do this into the future, but you hadn't made a decision to do that in your current long-term plan. Now you can amend your long-term plan, and you can do that at any time. And that's, that's the provision in the Act that allows you to, to say, at a point such as this, we're making a significant a decision about commencing a significant activity. We can't do that because we haven't communicated that to our community in our long-term plan. We need to do that, so let's start the process of consultation with our community, and at the conclusion of that, we'll then make a decision about whether to proceed with that activity or not. So that's the constitutional basis that sits behind the decision you're making, and that was the question I was asked by the Northcote Residents Association. And probably the critical aspect of that is, is this decision significant or not? Now, I've set out, in my opinion, a range of things that I think make this decision significant, and there's a list of them, the bullet points. Essentially, it's, you're looking to issues such as cost, certainly uh, been set at 50 million and probably more. This is your first public-private partnership, your first one. It's significant in the sense that you have to understand really fully what that involves. The resolution C indicates that the decision is of such significance that it says you must put this in a long-term plan, but it says to put it in a future one. In fact, that's not the process. It must be in the long-term plan before you make a decision to commence an activity. So your own officers, if you like, are acknowledging that that is a significant decision. 
All ratepayers will be affected by the underwrite because they'll be called upon to pay for that. There were a number of investors approached, but only one has come back and said they're prepared to support this project on the basis that you've negotiated with them. So 